internet. Internet. A stream online. TNT Radio Live. Today's news talk radio. TNT. Welcome back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to TNT Today's News Talk. We're broadcasting live for the next two hours. We're still in hour number one of this program today and appreciate you guys, especially everybody in the TNT chat community. We can see the numbers growing there again today. Uh, we passed the high watermark of 140 members in there yesterday. Let's get those numbers up to 150 uh, today if we can. We'll interact with you when we're able to during the program, but in the meantime, I want to welcome onto the program a very special guest, David Miller from the United Kingdom. He is an academic. Uh, he is also on the cutting edge of a major debate, uh, testing the limits of speech in the democratic world. Uh, I don't think I'm exaggerating there. I think it's a very important case, which David is facing his own case, uh, plus the legislation coming into the pipeline right now in the UK, but also in the United States, we see similar moves and resolutions in the US Congress to basically regulate speech, especially surrounding the issue of Israel. Uh, so let me welcome onto the program, David Miller right now. David, thank you for joining us uh, this week. It's a pleasure. David, uh, you know, as before we get get into some of the bigger uh, issues regarding speech legislation, um, you're embroiled in uh, a long running battle uh, personally um, with you yourself professionally, um, a major case uh, regarding uh, academia, I think, uh, and also could set a precedent right now. Um, for those of our listeners who aren't familiar or viewers who aren't familiar of your case, give us a little bit of a summary of what happened to you and then where this uh, is at right now, the process that you're uh, engaged in. Go ahead, David. So I was a professor of political sociology at the University of Bristol in the UK. I gave a lecture um, some six months after I'd started there on Islamophobia, in which I discussed the role of Zionism in pushing Islamophobia. Some students complained. There was a long process of um, going backwards and forwards. I was cleared three times of anti-Semitism, uh, and then I was summarily sacked for upsetting the students. And I appealed, I, the appeal failed. I then took the university to court in October last year, some nearly three years after I had been sacked. Uh, and uh, the, the court proceedings lasted until December. We're now waiting for the judgment. But the key question in the judgment is not um, the first point of my legal case, which was that I was wrongly dismissed, uh, which I think is pretty, pretty clear. But the, this, the key point is the second point which we made in, in my case, which was that the reason that I was sacked was because of my anti-Zionist views, that I, ha I have anti-Zionist views, I've been an anti-Zionist for some uh, considerable time, uh, and that I had expressed anti-Zionist views in criticising Zionist student groups uh, and indeed the Zionist movement more broadly uh, for its role in Islamophobia. And that, that was the reason I, I maintained that I was sacked. And in the case, the university witnesses uh, started off by claiming that, that that wasn't the case, it was because I'd upset students but eventually it became clear that really what they could they were concerned about with the things i'd said was that was the fact of the anti-zionism so uh, i'm hoping that the the judgment will uh uh which will come out any any day now will confirm that uh, it was the anti-zionist views which led to me being sacked and that the anti-zionist views are uh, to use the technical language in the british equality act of 2010 are worthy of respect in a democratic society. Now, the technical meaning of that in, 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 the, in the legal test where you used to establish whether uh, particular views are worthy of respect is, are these views akin to Nazism or not? Now, uh, in the particular case, the university changed its actual uh, legal case at the last minute as we started the tribunal, and it maintained that my views were akin to Nazism, which was a, a <laughs> terrible, terrible legal mistake that they made changing the strategy like that of course they couldn't establish any such thing and they tied themselves up in uh, terrible terrible knots in that process so it, we're in in the territory of potentially establishing the principle that anti-zionist views of the sort that i espoused are protected in law and it would be illegal to discriminate against people with anti-zionist views so, so the, the hope is that this establishes the principle that will protect many others uh, 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 from their employers' arb arbitrary sackings and uh, disciplinary uh, offences uh, uh, going forward. 
And did you face this this problem, which is now um, a serious problem, uh, whereby the institution or the establishment has conflated uh, anti-Zionist views with quote anti-Semitism, and then they're following the uh, the International Holocaust Remembrance Association's definition, the IHRA's definition of anti-Semitism, which continues to expand um, uh, by the year. But is is that a, a challenge that you ran up against in making these arguments? Oh, absolutely. Uh, when the, um, the complaints were first made, the uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's working definition had not been adopted by the university, and the, uh, the Zionist students who eventually uh, made the formal complaints uh, complained uh, and appealed the, the, uh, the rejection of their complaints on, uh, on the basis that, that the university hadn't used the IHRA. The university then unilaterally offered to the student to pause the complaint while they considered whether to introduce the IHRA and some six months later they duly did introduce the IHRA and then they re uh, started the complaint so that I could be judged under rules that they had just introduced uh, and of course that didn't work for them because uh, of course the the QC the external QC uh, who investigated the complaint determined that nothing I had said uh, was in any way anti-semitic and nor indeed did it breach the IHRA although of course as you say the, the reason for them introducing the IHRA is that they, they try and uh, uh, um, they try and sort of criminalize or uh, smear anti-Zionist views as if they are anti-Semitic. As everyone knows, the examples appended to the IHRA mainly discuss Israel as opposed to discussing racism against the Jews, uh, and that, of course, is the, the whole purpose of the definition: is to is to use a bludgeon to get uh, to pursue Israeli foreign policy objectives uh, uh, throughout the world. Yeah, because it's pretty clear uh, your your career, David, and your organization, Spin Watch, and even your your Twitter ID is at Tracking Power, which is exactly what you've been doing your whole career is identifying how power, the dynamics of power, works between government, society, and in the international uh, relations field as well. So it's pretty clear where you know you're coming from on that. Uh, and I think it's really important. And just before we move on, um, what what are the prospects in your case? Are you positive um, in terms of long term outcome on this? Uh, well, I'm I'm optimistic that, that we will have a good judgment on this uh, uh, very soon. If we don't have a good judgment, we'll appeal because they, it's perfectly plain the university didn't wasn't able to make its case, and actually the witnesses from the university all. Uh, collapsed under the weight of the own the contradictions of their evidence so we'll certainly appeal but i'm hoping for a, a good result the whole point of this of course is to push back against the overwhelming deluge of uh, of pressure that there is from the british state uh, uh under of course uh, its own pressure from the zionists to criminalize pro-palestinian uh, activism so we've had complaints uh, and uh, legal actions and police actions against uh, people uh, you, having particular leaflets or flying Palestinian flags or using the phrase from the river to the sea, even uh, having cartoons of of, uh, of people in paragliders which are held to somehow glorify or justify terrorism. These people have been taken into custody and uh, have been arrested or sometimes charged with the offences. Those people were charged with uh, a racially ag aggravated offence for holding an effigy of a dead baby on a, on a pro-Palestinian demonstration, as if that was somehow racist against the Jews. Uh, on the contrary, it's an anti-racist statement. But that's, that's the pressure that we get. And of course, the, you know, the government itself is trying to introduce a new anti-BDS, that's Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions legislation to make it illegal to boycott uh, mm -hmm. uh, Israel, uh, to make it illegal to boycott the pers pursuers and purveyors of genocide. I mean, truly, truly extraordinary times that we live in, but that's where the law is going. And my, I'm hoping my case will be the start of the fight back against that because the, you know, this will not go away without us standing together and 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 well, fighting back against these ridiculous uh, uh, rules and rules and regulations uh, and uh, defeating them once, once and for all. I, I, I put this under the banner, at least this is in, in the United States, where we're having, going through similar uh, challenges, David, as you know, um, but I'm, I'm put it under 
broadly under the banner of speech control, uh, because with, with all of the, the the town square, if you will, the global digital town square coalescing online on these major social media platforms, that's where the majority of the discourse is happening. Um, you see moves by governments to seize control of these platforms, at least to control the speech on them by uh, AI or algorithmic means or Physically, in the case of Twitter, um, the massive trust and safety departments at Facebook as well, um, basically looking and policing speech. Um, in the UK, David, and your case is a bit of a canary in the coal mine. Early, uh, you're an er you're an early symptom of this, I think, with your case. But what is coming down the pipeline now in the UK, especially regarding um, this issue as it relates to um, the the anti-Semitism speech or the accusations of anti-Semitism, um, and also in relation to BDS, I think those are um, absolutely linked. Because isn't BDS really just taking a political stance. So in effect, are we talking about censoring political speech across the board? What's happening in the UK right now? Well, yes, it is about censoring political speech. Of course it is. I mean, but let, let's remember that we, we live in a society where uh, the, the hegemon, the Western hegemon, the US, uh, is in decline. Uh, and uh, although it tries, uh, along with its allies in the UK, to impose order, this order is continually failing to be imposed. So it's very difficult for them to impose order on the social media companies, even though the social media companies are themselves very, very keen to uh, to adhere to the, uh, the pressure and to respond to the pressure that they're given. Facebook, of course, a company with, with very many Zionists in senior management positions, as well as, of course, taking advice from Zionist bodies and on who to censor. Uh, X Twitter or X is a slightly different case, um, uh, which we can talk about. But of course, Elon Musk has, is a, is fairly idiosyncratic, and of course, it's meant that in some way, respects, uh, Twitter or X has become much more uh, responsive to the public mood uh, since he's taken over. But of course, there are also other ways in which he's now trying to to interfere with it. Symptomatic of that, of course, is his statement that from the river to the sea is a genocidal and racist statement and will not be allowed henceforth on X. But since then, of course, its use has uh, gone through the roof uh, <laughs> and uh, increased by several magnitudes because, of course, he can't stop uh, people using a slogan like that because it's so popular. And that's, of course, the, the, the same with Facebook, even though it is constantly censoring uh, uh, pro-Palestinian speech, it cannot remove the, the absolute dominance of pro-Palestinian views uh, on Facebook and on Twitter, because that's world opinion, and so that that's the difficulty they're facing is that is their control. But look, the, the, the it is a question of political speech. But let's remember also that the 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 approach which is being pursued by the state of Israel uh, in relation to academic freedom and in relation to freedom of speech, and it, its position on freedom of speech and on academic freedom is is absolutely clear. We we see that, of course, first of all by the fact that they have destroyed every single university. Uh, in Gaza, uh, deliberately uh, and calculatingly destroyed them, uh, starting in, in uh, uh, late October and through to December, uh, after they destroyed the Islamic University of Gaza uh, by late December, they purposefully uh, executed the the rector, the, the, the president of the university, along with all of his family. So the, the view of the Zionists on academic freedom is that there should be no academic freedom at all for those who are pro-Palestinian. Now, it may seem hyperbolic to say this, but they would do the same with us in the UK and the US if they could get away with it. Of course, they can't get away with that. So what they do instead is that they send their agents and assets onto campus. They spy on students. They uh, defame students. They try and have them sacked. They have are able to sometimes get, even get the the uh, the very most senior uh, officials in universities, as has been the case in Harvard and Penn. Uh, uh, removed for the sin of, be, of saying something slightly less exacting than they would themselves want to have said, be, ha, have said about anti-Semitism. So they ha, they have a huge apparatus of disinformation, bullying, and intimidation on campus. Um, uh, I could go through some of the names of the organisations if you wish. Both in absolutely, the UK and yeah, America, yeah. Please do. Other other countries as well. So, for example, there's a there's, a, there's an organisation called the Israel on Campus Coalition, which is there to to spy. Uh, on students, and it uh, it uses and passes on intelligence uh, through, for example, the Anti-Defamation League, uh, an organization supposed to be about anti-Semitism, but which, of course, is always 
uh, being very, very close to the Mossad and indeed to, to Israeli intelligence before the creation of the State of Israel. Uh, it, it has been the case. It's, it was famously involved in the, a spy case in the 1990s where it was passing information to the, the apartheid regime of South Africa. And these agencies are there to spy on and collaborate with uh, Israeli intelligence organizations. They also have a, an apparatus for uh, producing trolls and troll farms and student groups on the campuses in the US. Of course, there's Hillel, which is the Zionist student organization in the UK. The same organization is called the Union of Jewish Students, and they're there to make sure that uh, uh, that no one can effectively do pro-Palestinian uh, activism. But let's also remember that there are other organizations on campus of so people uh, generally not aware of, which are also part of the Zionist movement. I'm, I'm thinking in particular of an organization called Chabad, which is a Hasidic sect, uh, which has 850, uh, has, has presence on 850 campuses worldwide, including in Belarus and Russia and China and all the places you wouldn't expect them to have offices, but th over a thousand in, in the US. And it's an organization which believes that uh, non-Jews have animal souls, that it's, per it's permissible to kill Palestinian babies because they might in the future grow up to threaten uh, the settlers in Palestine, an organization which should have no place in any de democratic society, but people don't even notice it's there to radicalize students on campuses across the US and indeed across the rest of the world. So there's a huge apparatus which the, the Israelis, the, the Zionist entity and the, the Zionist movement uh, in the US and other places, of course, the US has the biggest Zionist movement in the world. Uh, they, they put this apparatus into play to make sure that it's very, very difficult to support the Palestinians to uh, to call out genocide to uh, to to give meaningful solidarity to the Palestinians uh, and that that's the that's the apparatus of the Zionist movement in relation to to academic freedom and freedom of speech and then also in terms of uh, uh, adopting this the the IHRA definition of of anti-semitism I know the Labour Party has more or less done this if I'm not mistaken and this is one of the things uh, that happened after they ousted uh, their former leader Jeremy Corbyn but there's a lot of pressure for that to sort of be uh, adopted at a sort of higher level or integrated with legislation or something like this I mean how far along are they in that process because that seems like a, a, a major Rubicon to to cross if if that were the case what 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 do you think about that issue well i, I mean the the ihra is is the weapon of choice uh, of the zionist movement so in addition to you know bullying and intimidating this the, the weapon for doing that of course it has been the ihra this is a a, um, a, a, a working definition as it's called which was adopted by the IHRA in 2016, people think that's where, where it came from. It comes from this obscure organization, which is an international body. But actually, no, of course, it comes directly from uh, uh, the, the Zionist regime itself. They developed this uh, definition uh, in uh, the end of the 1990s, uh, in, in particular through the creation of the Global Forum for Countering Antisemitism, created in 2000. They then got this definition adopted by the European Union Monitoring Centre on Xenophobia, which is a formal part of the European Union, Union the European apparatus. Uh, and it was then on the website of that organisation for several years, and then they removed it from the website uh, and it became effectively, uh, uh, didn't have any any uh, uh, fixed abode after that. And that led to a, a crisis talks within the Global Forum for Countering Antisemitism in the period of 2013, 14 and 15, where they said, what we've got to do is we've got to find somewhere else to lodge this definition. Uh, and uh, of course, the place they found was the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, an organization which is effectively run by the Israeli government. Uh, and they then adopted that in 2016. That allowed them then to have the weapon to, uh, uh, to as you referred to, to attack the leader of the Labour Party, the most pro-Palestinian uh, leader of the Labour Party or any party in this country had ever had. Uh, and so the weapon was used to attack Corbyn. Uh, and of course, in order for that to, to be effective, they couldn't just have this definition, which lay there as a, a, on, a, on a computer or on a website. They had to have people to enact and to use the weapon. They had to have foot, feet and boots on the ground to do that. And so, of course, in the UK, uh, from starting from around 2009, but especially from 2014, the Zionists created a hu huge number of new uh, pro-Israel organizations, 40 or 50 new organizations, uh, in the UK, some have now uh, got out of uh, of use and have been closed down because they're 
their, their function has been uh, has been concluded. But they, they they created all these organisations which could then take complaints against uh, Labour councillors or uh, um, Labour Party members or members of solidarity groups, and they could then get use these complaints to try and have them removed from being candidates or members of the party, etc. And of course, that's the way in which it operates. They have this weapon, the definition, and they have boots on the ground. Uh, coordinated from Tel Aviv uh, and in many cases with money directly from Tel Aviv to to uh, undertake this activity. And some people think, you know, that uh, in, fact, in fact, people say the Zionists, some of the, sometimes the, the liberal and leftist Zionists say, oh, well, you you think that the Zionist uh, movement is all coordinated. And of course, it's not all coordinated. There are many different strands of Zionist ideas. Uh, there are the left wing ones and the right wing ones. Uh, and of course, this is true. There are left and right wing Zionists, but of course, they're all united on uh, on the fact of being and the clues in the name Zionist. And that means, of course, uh, believing in the genocidal idea that there's a right to a Jewish state in historic Palestine at the expense of the Palestinians. All Zionists believe in that, w whether they're nice liberal and left Zionists or not. And of course, they all work together to do that. And of course, what they also, also and we've found evidence of this in our research, they also coordinate together. So right-wing revisionist Zionists will coordinate with people who, who re regard themselves as being socialist Zionists in order to attack the enemies of Zionism, which, of course, is the Palestine Solidarity Movement. Yeah, and there's other groups uh, that also, you know, kind of act as lobbyists, really, for this type of activity, like Hope Not Hate, these sort of NGOs. There's an interesting one called UN Watch, I think. I think that's what yeah. it's called. And, and oh, that's just unbelievable the the stuff there they're many, doing many many organizations i mean on the example of hope not hate i mean i think you see in in both the us and uk i i, I imagine it may be the same in france and germany i haven't looked but in, in in the uk what happened was that very early on the british anti-racist movement became infected with zionist ideas and the, the way it did that was because after the second world war uh, an anti-fascist group was created, mainly with uh, returning Jewish ex-servicemen, many of whom were in the Communist Party, and they set up this organization, uh, an anti-fascist organization, to block fascists on the streets. And they, they did uh, fight the fascists. And it, so people in, in history think, think of this as a left-wing organization. There were many communists involved. Uh, but actually, of course, it, at the very, very beginning of that organization, uh, by 1948, the beginning of 1948, this organization of left-wing anti-fascists sent tens of its members to fight uh, the Palestinians in the Nakba uh, and was in, was engaged in that fight. And of course, also, uh, uni, uni, you know, the whole of the organization signed up to, affiliated to the Ergen, the revisionist uh, Zionist terrorist organization, which had bombed the King David Hotel, killing, killing I think, 91 uh, people, that, uh, including many British uh, military and other personnel. So, at the very beginning of the anti-racist movement in this country, there was a there was a strong revisionist Zionist uh, current, and that current has remained all the way through from the 1940s to the present day, including the setting up of uh, uh, an organisation called Searchlight, the anti-fascist uh, um, newspaper, and indeed the Community Security Trust, which is the UK's equivalent of the ADL. Both of these. Organizations were set up with people who came from the organization which had originally affiliated to the Ergen. And Hope Not Hate, which you mentioned, of course, comes from Searchlight. Uh, and Searchlight uh, famously uh, was revealed in the 1970s as coordinating not just with British intelligence, uh, but also with Israeli and indeed South African intelligence to uh, spy on the left and to spy on the pro Palestine movement, all under the cover of being an anti fascist organization and uh, of course the cst as well an organization which runs point for the israeli government which collaborates regularly with the mossad and ha has been involved with the mossad for decades even in its previous uh, uh um in incarnation so we what we see is that, that there's there's a way in which the anti-racist movement in this country has been uh infected and uh, and and compromised by the, its alliances with and the involvement of zionists Whose, whose blind spot, you know, big surprise, is racism against the Palestinians, against Arabs, and of course against Muslims too. Interesting how that uh, that, that all shapes up. Also, the Center for Countering Digital Hate, that's another uh, organization we could talk about. Maybe we'll save yeah. that for after the break here. I'm with David Miller, UK academic. We're talking about testing the limits of speech uh, in the democratic West, uh, especially as it relates to the situation right now um, in Gaza. David, um, 
this thing with uh, cleansing the Labour Party, sanitizing the Labour Party of wrong think. We thought it had finished. We thought they had done the job, but apparently not uh, the latest uh, victim of this, uh, Kate Ossimor, who's not a uh, inconsequential member of the party. She is a former uh, shadow minister holding a number of top positions in the government. Uh, she has just been ousted, and I have to go over to the uh, reporting on this, and the first thing I see in the headlines is, the Board of uh, British Deputies, or the Board of Deputies of British Jews, this organization, um, they are they seem to be the end-all be-all when it comes to making determinations of who can be sitting in political positions or not. This is like an incredible situation. What did you make of this latest incident? Well, it's a, a, an ongoing process of trying to cleanse um, the Labour Party of anyone who um, is willing to say anything publicly about the Palestinians. And of course, she made some rather innocuous comment about uh, on Holocaust Memorial Day about the genocide in Gaza. And that, of course, is not acceptable. Uh, what the uh, the line is, is that you have to not mention Gaza. You have to absolutely not say Gaza is a ho Holocaust and absolutely uh, not say Gaza is a genocide. To do so is somehow uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, which, of course, is a nonsense and is just, of course, the, the Zionist talking point on the issue. Now, the, well, you, well, you mentioned the, the Board of Deputies. Now, the Board of Deputies of British Jews poses as a an organisation which is there to represent um, Jews. Uh, um, um, and, of course, it only represents uh, a proportion of, of Jews. It's, it's elected through uh, um, the mainstream synagogues. Uh, most of the ultra-Orthodox synagogues don't partake of, of the board. But it used to be, um, back in the day, uh, an anti-Zionist organisation uh, until the 1940s when it was taken over by the Zionists in the, in the mid-40s before the creation of the State of Israel, the occupation of Palestine. Uh, but now, of course, it's uh, uh, and since then it's been uh, very pro-Israel, it's become more rapidly pro-Israel in recent years. Uh, it, uh, you know, it unblushingly says in its annual report that it cooperates closely with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the IDF spokesperson's office, etc., etc. So it's a, it's a Zionist lobby group. It has 202 members, I think, uh, up and down the country, which indicates this sort of the, the, the strength and the breadth of the Zionist movement in this country. But I, I, I wouldn't want your um, listeners of yours to think that uh, it's the Board of Deputies which, it, which influences uh, this uh, issue uh, as, as if it's one organization that's doing that of course the the Zionist movement is a much bigger set of organizations I've already alluded to the fact it has 200 odd members uh, but also there are other organizations which have um, a range of members the Zionist Federation has around 35 members the Jewish uh, Leadership Council has around 35 members too uh, and then of course there are many other associated uh, Israel lobby groups but the key people who are uh, uh, infiltrating and um, influencing the Labour Party are not uh, external lobby groups. Funnily enough, it's it, it's these, these are groups which come to lobby an, an organisation which is already taken over by Zionists, and in particular by in the personage of of, of a, a guy called Trevor Chin. He was one of the ones who was revealed the two the two key Zionists who were revealed to have funded the leadership campaign of Keir Starmer. Uh, and they revealed it late uh, so that the votes had already been cast before uh, people would find out. And when shortly after he was elected, he, he ran a meeting uh, to uh, to discuss with the Israel lobby uh, whether he had sufficiently cauterized the party and removed enough uh, anti-Semites, i.e. people who were willing to support Palestine from the party. And, the, and all of the key lobby groups were there. But also in the meeting was, was Trevor Chin. Now, he wasn't there as a representative of a lobby group, although he is, uh, by any uh, um, by any stretch of the imagination, the one of the key leaders of the uh, UK Zionist movement. He's been on the, uh, the the top of the the United Jewish Israel Appeal, which is the biggest fundraising uh, charity for Israel in the country for decades, literally decades. So he is effectively the leader of the Labour Party. The leader of the sorry, the, the Labour Party. I mean, that's that's what I'm going to get into. He's the leader of the Zionist movement. But he was at that meeting not as a representative of an Israel lobby group, but as a representative of the Labour Party. He was there as a Labour Party official to be lobbied by the groups which he himself helps to run. I mean, truly extraordinary position. So, of course, this is going to go on and on through the party. Anyone who's willing to stand up 
and say anything mildly critical about um, the Zionists and the, and the genocide in Gaza is going to be removed from the party. And it, it remains to be seen uh, exactly how far that goes. We, we're waiting to see if, for example, John McDonnell, the deputy leader, uh, who sorry, who was the deputy leader, is is going to to uh, be removed as well because, of course, he's he said things which have been mildly critical of Israel. And uh, the, you know, so the question is whether all of the left, uh, the remaining left, will be removed from the party or not. The end result of this, David, is there's no discernible difference between uh, the Conservative Party, the Tories, uh, and Labour when it comes to what's happening right now uh, in the Middle East. And, and you, there, there can't be a bigger example of a humanitarian catastrophe. Um, or in, it, as it's said by the International Courts of Justice, it's, it's being uh, labeled as a genocide. Um, investigation has already commenced on this. So, I mean, the international consensus on this seems yep. to be pretty clear, but yet there's there's no movement within UK politics. I don't see any dissent, basically, to condemn oh. Israel. It's incredible. There, I mean, that, that the, the broad point is correct, but I mean, I would point to two things. One is the, the recent um, change of heart of the uh, British Foreign Office, which is said just the other day, that it wants a Palestinian state for the first time. Now that's really very, very interesting. Uh, we don't know what the choreo choreography of it is and how it relates to the ongoing negotiations in Qatar over a potential ceasefire, etc. Clearly, there will be some relationship, but that, that's a very in, um, uh, important signal. But I would also say that look, that your your point about the the Uni Party is absolutely correct, and of course, it's correct in the in the US too. In the Conservative Party, there still are people, the occasional person, who is willing to ask penetrating questions of the government. And there was a session the other day in Parliament where the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, the former Prime Minister, David Cameron, uh, who was elevated to the House of Lords in order to become Foreign Secretary, was put through his paces by a Tory MP, a new Tory MP, a woman called Alicia Kearns. Now, Alicia Kearns has a very interesting backstory. She was a Foreign Office official. She was either in MI6 or very close to MI6. She ran the propaganda operations in Syria uh, for the British government, including uh, involvement with organizations which were involved in the uh, false chemical weapons attacks uh, in Syria. And so she's not, she's by no means a leftist. She is you know, she probably still remains an asset of uh, of MI6, but she put him through his paces and she said she wanted to pin him down and say, have you not seen any documents from uh, Foreign Office legal advisors which say that Israel has broken international humanitarian law by the, the siege and by the attacks that it's done on the people of Gaza? And he squirmed really badly, and she really scored some points. And that was that was a very, very impressive performance from someone who, uh, on many other political issues, you wouldn't expect any such thing. So there, there is some dissent within the system, um, not in the party system, but within the actual uh, security apparatus. And you would expect there to be some dissent within MI6, uh, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Agency, as opposed to MI5, the Domestic Intelligence Agency, where, where dissent really ever happens, it's my understanding. So, th th yes, there is a, pro a problem, but we are seeing some movements here. And, of course, we've seen uh, suggestions in the press that there will be an announcement on Saturday about a ceasefire, which, which looks like it won't be correct. But there clearly are the negotiations in the background, which is which this is where there's just feeding a kind of propaganda campaign, a shadow propaganda campaign about what's happening. Uh, uh, the Palestinian resistance have said that they are not going to uh, engage in a process which will undermine the Palestine Liberation Organization. Now, that's a really very, very interesting way of phrasing it. Because, of course, who would have, who would think that, that Hamas would be a fan of the Palestine Liberation Organization? Remember, this is the umbrella body which uh, effectively runs the Palestinian Authority and which in which Fatah is dominant and which uh, Hamas has been excluded from, as have the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, mm -hmm. uh, two of the key or, uh, armed organizations, their military groups in, in Gaza. So we, we um, um, what we know, of course, is that there's, the whisper is that they, there's an attempt to bring in uh, the Saudis, uh, um, amazingly enough, and uh, possibly the, the Qatari government to administer the West Bank and Gaza or, or Gaza. Now, of course, what 
Hamas are saying there is we're not we're not going to go for that and that there's no chance of having a negotiation which could be successful on the basis of that so we're seeing uh, uh, some kind of shadow boxing going on in this negotiation and i i would bet that the british government statement about the recognition of the palestinian state is part of that of course we also saw didn't we amazingly only two weeks after the british labor party said that they were not going to recognize the palestinian state as soon as the tories uh, said that they were going to recognise the Palestinian state. The Labour Party changed its mind again, and it's back on and said, "Oh yes, well, of course, we always believed in a, a Palestinian state." You know, just a, a true, you know, an obvious lie. But the kind of lie you get from uni parties when they're caught out in in in, uh, in the in the algorithm of politics. Yeah, that that is interesting, David. That's going to come up as well in the U, uh, UN General Assembly when this issue eventually lands uh, there as well in this current legal process with the ICJ. And I'm going to say that comment you made um, very interesting about that uh, Conservative Party member uh, showing some dissent uh, there. We've also seen pr people who supported Bellingcat, uh, a regime change operatives uh, in media and online have have gone behind the Palestinians on this issue. So that that's an interesting schism that you've identified that's very real david and very identifiable right across the board um so that's that I, I think and that could be within civil service as well in the intelligence services there are people who do have um that political belief they do uh, on on that issue they support the palestinians but not on all the other issues that we might be uh covering and arguing uh people like yourself uh, and others and more anti-imperialist uh you could say uh, to use that term but very very good point that's that's worthy of another discussion by the way david like a deep a deep discussion on that maybe we'll have to assemble a panel on that one because i think that tells a lot about the story of you know geopolitics policy and media over the last uh, you know 10 plus years but uh, very interesting david miller uh thank you very much and before we go just give everybody a shout out about your show uh what you're doing on social media where people can find your work go ahead Okay, so I, um, I produce and uh, um, co-present a show called Palestine Declassified on Press TV, uh, which is uh, on uh, X, uh, formerly Twitter, at P Declassified. You can follow us there. I'm on Twitter on uh, as, at um, tracking underscore power. And maybe I say one word about uh, um, my oh, legal briefly, case. briefly. I, I think we're running out of time. Um, my but... legal case, you can, you can support my case at uh, fightingfund.org. To follow david miller you'll see the links to his legal case there get behind that it's a good effort folks thank you david miller for joining us appreciate it top of the hour news headlines coming up stay with us we got zachary foster another academic on the other side we're going to deep dive into the icj genocide case and much more stick around we'll be back in a few